The axially loaded beam is a very important problem in structural dynamics. It arises in many circumstances in modeling. For example, when modeling the failure of power lines due to bending fatigue. Until now, we've just considered these to vibrate like a string, but of course, it does have a little bit of flexural rigidity. In addition, axially loaded beams are very important in the buckling of columns. It's important in all kinds of rotating beam models. This includes turbine models and turbo machinery, of course, helicopter rotor blades. So you will see this axially loaded beam again and again in practice. And really it combines two models that we've seen already. The one is the model for the string under tension, and the other is the model for the transverse vibrations of an Euler Bernoulli beam. We proceed by zooming up on this little differential element, and we've seen this before in the case of the Euler Bernoulli beam, that this little element has a shear on each side of it, V and V plus dV. It has a moment on each side of the element, opposing moments, M and M plus dM. And then in general, there's some distributed load F, which is a load per unit length acting across the element. The length of the element is dx, and this dotted line represents the elastic axis of the beam. In addition to the Euler Bernoulli beam model, we need to add the model for the string under tension. And what that looks like is this element has a force P on the one side of it, and then on the other side, P plus dP and this P is defined as a tensile load. So we proceed as always with Newton's second law, and we do this for the differential element, but in the Z direction, in the transverse direction. So fundamentally, we've got to sum up the forces and set it equal to MA. And looking at this element first, the one on the left, we can see that we've got V in the vertical direction, V upwards, and a V plus DV downwards. So it's V minus V plus DV, plus the force due to the distributed load F, which is a load per unit length. So it's F times dx, which is the length of the differential element. And then what we want to do is add the components of P in the vertical direction. So we've got P plus dP, and we want the sine component of this angle. The angle is theta plus d theta. So that's P plus dP times sine of theta plus d theta, and then similarly on this side, we've got to subtract the component of P that is downwards, and that's just minus P sine theta. We set that equal to the mass of this differential slice. The mass is equal to rho times the volume. The volume is the cross-sectional area times dx. So rho A dx is the amount of mass in this differential slice. And we've got to multiply that by W double dot. And I remind you that I'm using the convention here where a dot denotes the derivative with respect to time, and I'll use a comma x like this to denote the derivative with respect to space. The second equation we require is derived by performing a moment balance around this point zero. In this case, consistent with the Euler Bernoulli assumption, there is no rotation of the cross sections, so therefore the sum of the moments must equal zero. Okay, and this implies we have two contributions from the m and the m plus dm. We're going to assume that clockwise is the positive direction, even though, based on our coordinate system, the y-axis actually runs into the page. It makes no difference for this purpose. So clockwise, we have m plus dm, and we're going to subtract from that m. We need to then subtract the component due to the shear force that's acting downwards. Of course, this shear force acts through the point zero, so there's no moment arm. The shear force downwards is acting in the negative direction, so minus V plus dV times the moment arm, which is just dx, plus the contribution to the moment from the distributed load F. The load is F times dx. It can be assumed that this net force is acting at the midway point, so the moment arm would be dx divided by two, and this is all equal to zero. In addition, since we're going to make a small displacement assumption in this problem, we can make the approximation that sine of theta plus d theta is approximately equal to theta plus d theta, and that could be approximated as theta times partial theta partial x dx would be the first order Taylor approximation of that. And then this can be rewritten as theta is actually w comma x. It's the derivative of w with respect to x is the slope of the beam. So w comma x and then the derivative of theta with respect to x will give us w comma xx 
dx. And I'll just write it here in green where theta is equal to dw dx or w comma x is the shorthand we're going to adopt. Let's give these some numbers, number one, number two, and number three. And number one and two we want to use for later, so I'm going to put a box around them. These are intermediate solutions. Let's continue on the next page, and I'm going to copy equations one and equations three over. And the idea now is we want to substitute equation three into equation one. This is just straight substitution. So where I see a sign of theta plus d theta, I'm just going to substitute expression 3 in there. v minus v, the v's cancel. dv I can rewrite as partial v partial x dx, negative sign in front of it, plus f dx, plus p, plus dp again is partial p partial x times dx times w comma x plus w comma x x dx minus p times theta which is p w comma x and that is equal to rho a dx w double dot then i'm going to save you the details of the math just multiply it all out expand it what you will find is you get this term here that has a dx squared in it that's a higher order term since dx is very very small much much less than one dx squared is negligible compared to the rest and then this term p w comma x cancels with the negative p w comma x and that of course is equal to rho a dx w double dot so we can now cancel and simplify by dividing everything through by dx and what that leaves us with is minus v comma x plus f plus partial with respect to x of this this is just really expanded and in its unexpanded form is p w comma x if i take the derivative of p w comma x i've got to apply the product rule and i will end up with p w comma x x plus p comma x w comma x that's where that comes from and that is equal to rho a w double dot let's call this equation four and we'll save that for later and then from the previous page copying equation two down simplifying that what we find is we expand it out the m's cancel the dm will become partial m partial x dx uh, minus v dx minus partial v partial x dx times another dx so partial v partial x dx squared plus f times dx squared over 2 equals zero. Uh, these two terms cancel because they're higher order terms, the, the last two terms, because they have a dx squared in it. And then finally, this gives us the very simple solution that V, the shear force, is just partial m partial x. The shear force is the derivative of the moment. We discovered this previously for the euler bernoulli beam. Let's number this number five, and we'll put a box around these two because we want these for later. In fact, let's just copy 4 and 5 to this page. Okay, we also know from strength of materials that for an Euler-Bernoulli beam, the moment is equal to EI W comma XX. I assume you all know that by now. This we'll call equation 6. Put a box around that. And then by substituting equation 6 into equation 5, we get the well-known result for the shear force is equal to EI W comma XX comma X. We'll call this number seven. And then we need to substitute seven into equation four. That gives us negative EI W comma XX comma X plus F plus P W comma X comma X is equal to rho A W double dot. Now, it can easily be shown that for the small displacement theory, P is constant. This has to do with the fact that there is no acceleration in the axial direction. So as a result, we can take P outside of the derivative and rewrite this as, I'll write it longhand now, since this is the final step, the final form of the equation, is D2 by DX squared of EI D squared W DX squared plus rho A D squared W DT squared minus p d squared w dx squared is equal to f. This is the equation of motion for the axial loaded beam. 
we can simplify it a little bit further for our purposes by assuming the free vibrations of a uniform beam. So the free vibrations will knock out the F on the right-hand side. And the fact that it's uniform means that EI is constant. So I can bring that outside of the derivative. And I end up with EI, the fourth derivative of W with respect to X, plus rho A d squared W dt squared minus P d squared W dx squared is equal to zero. And that is it. We're done with our equations of motion. Let's give these some numbers. Number, what are we up to? Number eight and number nine. And I'm going to put red boxes around this because this is actually what we've tried to solve. Okay, so we're almost there. What remains for us to do in this video is to find a general solution to this equation of motion for the free vibration problem. And I'm going to start off by pasting equation nine back here. And I remind you, we've seen this in previous videos, we're going to use a technique called the separation of variables to solve the equations of motion. I'm going to go through it quite quickly in this video because we have seen it before in other videos. Links to that appear in the description below. And I remind you that the idea behind separation of variables is that we can write the displacement w of x and t as two separate functions multiplied together. So this we'll say is equal to w of x times t of t some function of x times another function of time only. And with the assumption of simple harmonic motion for the time-dependent part, we know that the form of t of t is tau times e to the i omega t. And for those of you who hate using complex notation, you can instead write it as t of t equals a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. If you substitute that instead for t of t, you'll get the identical result. So we now need to substitute equation 10 into equation 9. And that gives us EI W comma XXXX minus omega squared rho AW minus P W comma XX all times tau E to the I omega T, which is common in all of these terms. Further, I can cancel tau E to the I omega T because we know that's never equal to zero. I also want to make the point that we're now using capital W's after the substitution. Um, I denote the capital W's with these little bars on the top of them. So I hope that doesn't cause any confusion. Let's give this a number. We'll call it number 11. And then we proceed in the usual way by assuming a solution for W of X of the form C e to the Rx. This is a standard procedure that we've used all along. Let's number this 11, 12. So substituting equation 12 into equation 11, we get EIR to the fourth minus omega squared rho A minus PR squared all times CE to the RX equals zero. Again, we can cancel CE to the RX, which is never zero. And then we can simplify the equation by dividing through by EI as R to the fourth minus P over EI R squared minus rho a omega squared divided by ei is equal to zero. We'll call this equation 13, and equation 13 is the characteristic equation. Now the characteristic equation can easily be solved using the quadratic formula. Let's just copy it down here. And then the quadratic formula gives us that r1 and 2 squared, the squares of the two roots, would be p divided by 2 ei plus or minus the square root of p divided by 2ei quantity squared plus rho a omega squared over ei. We'll number this equation 14. And just a reminder that the roots that come from r1 will be the plus sign of this. And so all we need to do is take the square root, the plus or minus square root of what is r1 squared. In the case of r2, we recognize that this quantity here is always greater than p over 2ei because this is p over 2ei once we take the square root. So this quantity is always going to be less than or equal to zero. As a result, the roots R2 are going to be imaginary. I remind you that what we did when the roots were imaginary is we actually took the negative of what was in here, and then we just multiplied it by I. And now we're done. The last thing I need to remind you is the two positive roots give rise to cinch and cosh, the hyperbolic sine and cosine functions, while the imaginary roots give rise to the cosine and sine functions. 
Thus, we can write the shape function, capital W of X, as C1 cosh R1X plus C2 cinch R1X plus C3 cosine R2X plus C4 sine R2X. We'll number this equation 15 and put a red box around it. And we have four unknowns. Clearly, we're going to need four boundary conditions. That's two at each end of the beam in order to solve for our four constants. That's all I'd like to say about this video. I hope you found something useful in it. If you have, please go ahead and smash those like buttons. It really gets to help other people see the videos too. If you'd like to be notified of new videos as they're released, please go ahead and hit those subscribe buttons and click the bell next to it. If you have any questions, comments, or just general advice for me, I would love to hear from you in the comments section below. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.